A group of abortion rights supporters and service providers spoke at a vigil outside the Monroe County Courthouse Wednesday, a day before a near total abortion ban went into effect in Indiana. Everyone deserves to have a choice and a voice. And Jessica Marchbank of All Options Pregnancy Resource Center says more than 1,300 people have called the Hoosier Abortion Fund since April seeking access to resources. Hundreds of Hoosiers every single month. They contact us because they need an abortion and they're having trouble accessing it. Marchbank says her organization is deepening ties with out-of-state groups for transportation and hotels that provide abortion services. Now, co-chair of Hoosier Jews for Choice, Ali Cohen, says her group is focusing on voter registration. SB1 is, comes from a very particular Christian perspective that goes against, um, goes against Jewish belief and our Jewish practices and tradition. Um, and in that sense, this bill restricts our religious freedom, right, to practice. And she says the vigil was meant to be an opportunity for people to not only grieve, but also come together for political empowerment. We're joined now by Benta Boutier, who has been working on a story about the history of reproductive access in Indiana. Welcome to the show, Bente. You know, I know you did a lot of digging at the state archives. What'd you find? Thanks, Joe. Indiana's first abortion legislation went on the books in the 1800s, setting punishment for performing an abortion at a year in county jail and a $500 fine. But between 1973 and 1975, Governor Otis Bowen received 44 letters, all asking him to support legislation against abortion access. After Roe, most legislation, legislative sessions saw some legislation introduced trying to restrict access. I also spoke with medical experts and a woman who had an illegal abortion before Roe. Here's what they had to say. A student at Purdue in 1969, Jude Wilkinson found out she was pregnant from a doctor she'd gone to asking for birth control. She had tried to get birth control from a doctor on campus previously, but was denied because she wasn't married. I knew I couldn't raise this baby. and. I knew there was a way, I wanted to find a way, and my only other option was to go to New York, which I, I didn't know anybody out there, and I, but I, that probably would have been my second choice. Wilkinson learned of another student who was also pregnant, who was from Indianapolis and knew the name of someone who did abortions there. They went to a three-story White House near the old Winona Memorial Hospital, south of 38th Street. When we walked into the house, there were several women and they had um, folding chairs, card table chairs, around what was the living room, you know, what would have been the living room. And we sat and waited and he called us up one at a time. She remembers an exam table with stirrups upstairs. She didn't get any anesthetic when her uterus was scraped. And the pain was excruciating. And I had a literal, literal out-of-body experience where my, I was, watching from the ceiling at myself. I closed my eyes and I was watching at the ceiling by myself, at myself, and just waiting for it to be over. Wilkinson started to hemorrhage when she got back to campus. She saw a doctor and told him she'd miscarried. The doctor didn't believe her and asked for the name of her abortionist. He said, if you tell me the name of the doctor, he said, I will, um, I will know whether or not it was a reputable procedure. And um, so I told him and he said, yep, he said, this guy is known for not killing people. He gave her antibiotics and told her to rest. Indiana has only one recorded death from a botched abortion that happened in 1988. But Dr. Philip Eskew, who practiced as an OBGYN for nearly 40 years, thinks many more people in Indiana have died while trying to end a pregnancy. Indiana should be focused on improving maternal mortality, not on restrict, restricting the reproductive rights of girls and women. He testified last month at the State House before they passed Senate Bill 1. He says deaths connected to an abortion wouldn't necessarily be recorded as that, but as the illnesses, women technically died from afterwards. We had one girl that came in that had been uh, uh, 
treated with some type of an instrument and was bleeding and she was severely infected and later died from pelvic inflammatory disease. He told state lawmakers that a ban would not stop abortions from happening. And that's what I'm so concerned about, as so many other doctors that testified uh, did. It's just uh, unfortunate that people, mostly men in the legislature, are making decisions uh, affecting women. And I think that, to me, is the worst part of the whole thing. A lot has happened for Wilkinson since 1969. She's given birth to and raised two children, and she got a law degree. Now she works remotely. She likes art and loves her cat. But I don't understand legislatures dictating to me my decision between me and my doctor. She's also a cancer patient and joined a protest against the abortion ban at the State House despite the risks it posed to her health. Two, four, six, eight, separate the church and state. She says she's tired of women having to fight. I don't think it's fair. 50 years, 50 years, we had a right and now it's gone. A lawsuit filed by four abortion providers in the state challenging the law will be heard Monday in the Monroe County Circuit Court. They argue the law's ban on abortion clinics is unlawful discrimination under the state constitution. All right, thanks, Benta. And, you know, the abortion issue ban is, is not going away soon. Here to talk more about what the future hold is Shruti Rana, a professor of law at the Hamilton Luger School and the Maurer School of Law. Welcome to the show, Professor. Thank you. So, and you've been a vocal opponent of the law, testifying at the State House, speaking out on panels. Why is this so important to you? This law is just devastating. For the first time, a constitutional right has been stripped away, and we know that the consequences of this law will be devastating throughout Indiana. We know that women and pregnant people will die. We know that um, fundamental human and civil constitutional rights are all at risk. We know that um, over half of our population has had its equal citizenship denied under the law, and many more rights are at risk. And so I think really, you know, as an American, I have an obligation to support the Constitution and our democracy. As a lawyer, I have an obligation to support the rule of law. And as a mother, I have an obligation to protect our children and fight for our future. And this law places all of that at risk. And there's a couple suits against uh, the state over the ban, including one filed here in Monroe County. Uh, what are they challenging? So they are challenging the law on equal protection and discrimination grounds, basically saying um, barring people from exercising bodily autonomy and privacy over their reproductive health choices is a violation of both the Indiana and federal constitution. So we know Senator Lindsey Graham proposing a federal ban if the GOP gains control of Congress. Do you see that having a chance? I think it's very possible. Um, as the um, as the Congress is currently constituted, it, I don't think it would pass. But um, it's if um, the composition of Congress changes even just slightly, I think there's a very good chance that ban could pass. In the Senate, you only need two or three seats to flip. In the House, you only need about five or six seats to flip. And if those two things happen, I think it's very possible for such a ban to be passed. Just looking ahead to elections this fall, do you, any effect do you think overturning of Roe will have? Yeah, right now we think that the decision in Dobbs and overturning Roe has really been electrifying for particularly women and young people. We know that they're going to the polls in much larger numbers. They are saying that abortion is at the top of their list for the important issues that they are voting on. They're worried about their constitutional and human rights. They're worried about their future. So we do think it'll have a big impact. Um, the scope of these changes are um, quite unique and largely unprecedented. So the data we have is really hard to read because the people who are out there um, coming out to vote on these issues, many of them are people who don't traditionally vote and our models are based on the people who traditionally vote. So I think a lot is up for grabs. I think there's a lot that's changing and we'll see what happens on election day. We just have under 30 seconds left. You know, Senate postponed a vote on codifying same-sex marriage after midterms. You concerned that could be overturned as well? Yes, I do. The decision in jobs placed marriage equality at risk as well. And so I think, again, if the composition of the Senate and the House changes, then I think there's a chance this vote can pass. All right. We have to leave it there. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it.